Okay, challenges of technology entrepreneurship. It does have some that are a little different from other types of entrepreneurship. First of all, there's the challenge of the diversity of skills that are needed. It needs somebody who understands the technology and it needs somebody who understands business and how to get a startup off the ground, the entrepreneur. Here's an example. The two Steves. Steve Jobs on the right you probably recognise. He's the entrepreneur. The one on the left is Steve Wozniak. He's the technologist. Now, Steve Jobs may have been technically competent, but Steve Jobs was the real technology geek. Together, they created Apple. Second challenge is more research and development, that's what R&D stands for, is usually required before you can actually launch a technology venture. In other words, you've got to have the product ready before you can actually start the business, and that takes more time than it does if, for example, you're just selling something. So first of all, you have to develop the technology. You might have to build production facilities, depending on what sort of technology it is. And all of that consumes money, and it takes time. And finding the money takes time as well, which is a second problem. Third challenge is what you might call technology risk. You aren't sure if your solution is actually going to work or whether you can actually make it. So usually, as Steve Blank is fond of pointing out, market need is the highest risk. Most businesses fail because they don't find product market fit. And the next highest risk is that you can't put together the team of people who can make it happen. And that's a whole other subject which I won't go into a lot of detail. With technology entrepreneurship, however, then the technology risk becomes higher because the technical feasibility might not be proven. You're not sure whether you can make it or you're pretty confident you can, but you're not sure how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost, which means you don't know what you're going to have to sell it for either. But market risk is still important. Now, I'm going to show you this video right now and the blog entry you can read later as a short article. This video um, was recorded um, at a series of workshops that Steve Blank did on Lean Startup with the medical, um, in the medical field. So uh, we're, we're Vitruvian Medical Devices and our product is uh, something to treat hernias before they happen from people who have surgeries. We've had 14 interviews. We uh, changed our canvas a little bit. Um, we are talking mostly with surgeons. So of the 14 uh, interviews that we did, over two thirds were, were with actual surgeons. Um, when we said that we had a product that might you know, cost $1,000 that would prevent a hernia, they said they would pay actually $20,000 if we had a product that could prevent a bio, bio leak. So Hobart's pupils dilated at that point. <laughs> Not, not, not the surgeons, but his pupils dilated. If we could prevent the bio leak for that surgeon, they would pay a lot more money for that. But for the, the product that we're proposing, they even thought $1,000 might be too high for that. Uh, that, that. That would be too high of a price to pay for that, that product. So these are things that we learned. Awesome. So did you feel like this was a worthwhile week? Did you learn something? Oh, it, it, it saved us probably several years worth of... No, seriously. Of, no, seriously. Because our, our thought is that Surgeons would embrace this, right? And so what we didn't realize is that they're not embracing it because they don't think it's a, a problem that they have. And what was the last phrase you used before I interrupt? This would save you several what? Uh, years. I can't wait for the next nine weeks. <laughs> As the video shows, market risk is still really important. What those scientists found out was that the product they were developing didn't have a market. But in the process of doing that research, they found out another market which would be far more lucrative. And now they have something else to work on. The other challenge, next challenge is financing. Because 
you have to develop the technology and potentially some equipment and factories or something like that to build the technology, then it takes time and it costs money. So you've got to get that money from somewhere. Now, this is quite a complicated diagram, don't worry too much about the details, but what it's basically showing you is that at the beginning of a startup, you don't make money, you lose money. And you've got this period of time before you actually start to make some, uh, uh, make some sales, or if it's in financing, you have got enough um, of a good opportunity to convince investors that it's worthwhile putting money into it before you're ready to make sales. In other words, if it's technology, you've done enough to convince them that somebody will buy it, that it's possible to do, that you are the people who know how to do it, and then they will put some money in to help you get there. Until you actually get to this stage, you're in what's called the valley of death. Now this applies to any sort of business that's looking for, that requires, um, if what shall we say, professional finance. In other words, it can't be started out of your own savings. The thing is, with technology ventures, what can happen is that they just never get out of the valley of death. So that's their big risk. They are more um, inclined to need external financing and they are more dependent on it. They will need it over a longer period of time because there's more to spend money on and there's more uncertainty about how much money they'll need. So financing is a challenge. On the other hand, investors like tech. And finally, this is a problem. Dividing ownership is a problem for any startup venture. But as I said before, technology ventures do tend to need a founding team rather than an individual or even a couple of people. So becomes this question about who owns how much of the business. Now, dividing it equally is not usually a good idea because in reality, contributions are not equal. So how much should each founder own? Um, right now, you might think that there's a fair way to divide it, but things will change over time. You know, some people will want to move out of the business um, other people will find that their skills are not suitable for growing the business to the next stage and they need to bring someone in. So what share should that new person have? It's complicated. Typical sorts of issues that arise is what we call sweat equity versus cash equity. So one founder's got cash, um, whereas another one hasn't got any cash but they've got expertise. So they work in the business um, without earning um, a salary or only earning a very small salary. And by that, they earn their equity share of the business. Other issue is different objectives, and this is very common, that um, once the business has kind of got past the startup stage, or maybe even before then, if it's taking a long time to get out of startup, one person wants to keep on with it, but another one wants to exit. One person wants to grow it because they can see the future potential, but the other one want, goes, look, we've done all this work, we're now in a position where we can make some money out of it, I just want out. So these things have to be negotiated. Some approaches. Seth Godin, who writes on marketing, he's a very, very interesting man um, to read and to watch his videos. Look him up on TED Talks. His suggestions are make a list of what has to happen for the business to be successful and you divide up a small amount of equity based on that and you give more as contributions are made over time. So in other words, even though somebody, in effect you have to earn 100% of the business, you basically say, well, you've only owned this, this much of it so far. And the other advantage of that is if you need to bring in external investors, such as the dragons on dragon's den or the sharks on shark tank, you've got uh, a portion of equity reserved for them without eating into the bit that you've said is yours. Steve Blank suggests looking at the key activities, partners and resources side. In other words, the left-hand side of the business model canvas, which you'll learn more about in Startup Fundamentals. And if your founding team doesn't cover all of these, you need another founder and the relative importance of their contribution to those 
key activities and resources or partnerships is um, how you work out how much of the equity, how much of the share in the business each person should own. There's a startup scene in, in Melbourne and there's some links here and that's not the whole list of it. And they are often focused on technology startups. So if you're interested in this area, this is where you can go and find out what's going on in Melbourne. Bear in mind though that tech often means software where development costs are lower and some of the issues we've talked about don't necessarily apply. So takeaways on technology entrepreneurship. First of all, technology entrepreneurs don't necessarily invent or develop the technology. And what's more, people who do invent or develop technology often don't have the entrepreneurial skills, so you're more likely to have a team um, founding team. Uh, you're more likely to have a startup that is founded by a team. That's a better way of saying it. Also, it has challenges that are not so much of a problem for other fields. It does tend to require greater diversity of skills. It takes more time to develop and launch to the stage where you can actually start selling something to customers. And there's a greater risk that your solution will not work because the technology is, to some extent, unproven or unknown. But it also has some advantages. Technology enterprises, technology ventures, are usually one of the best um, fields in which you can act, attract external investment. So venture capital, business angels, they like technology startups. So if you're a bit put off by all the challenges, remember that the rewards are often greater as well. And the final thing with technology enterprises is once you've built the technology and you have identified a market that has a high demand for that technology, then the profits can usually um, accumulate quite quickly.